tonight at the museum, I'm doing something that I haven't done for quite a long time. I'm giving a lecture. I'm actually giving a lecture on the immigration of Italians coming to America. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have the Lower East Side Preservation Association come in and basically uh, organize this event for us and actually have a full house. So it's a great experience right down here on the Library Street. I hope everybody enjoys it. I think that's kind of sweet, actually. Um, of course, this is a famous landmark, which you don't know of anymore. This is 187 Grand Street, where the poster shop is next door. Well, okay. 187 Grand Street was Rossi's first, Ernest Rossi's first establishment. He came here in 1910. He established his, his, um, his music, his libreria, which was selling sheet music. Sheet music was a huge, huge part of, uh, the, of, the, of the sales that took place in, in Rossi's. Why? Because that's how the immigrants would entertain themselves. You know, they either played mandolins or guitars, a little concertina, and they would sit around. There was no radio. There was no television. Forget about it. Radio they didn't have. You know, they was, there was no motion pictures for them to go and see. So they would entertain themselves. They'd play some music on musical instruments. We have a mandolin on, on, on exhibition. But I don't know how many of you got to see uh, Guitar Heroes at the Metropolitan Museum of Art last, last summer. You missed it, huh? Well, it's too bad because they had... This made me so proud because they was the first time that I can recall a major cultural institution having an exhibition besides the one that I did at the Historical Society and their premises. Guitar heroes, Montagnoni, D'Agosto, and Agostino, all lived in Little Italy. These are some of the most famous guitar makers in America, and they had an exhibition of their work, and it was just absolutely magnificent. Well, of course, we know Italians are very musical. They love music. I mean, obviously, Rossi had a lot of instruments, but you also had a lot of people who made instruments down here as well. We also had a pian you also had pianola stores as well. We have in the Rossi showcase in the back. I've got there was a there was a um, pianola factory down here as well too, where they made the upright pianos, where they had the you rolls piano. For those of you who are younger than me, we don't know what they are. They are you know you would put these rolls inside an upright piano and they had little holes in them and they you'd pump it with your feet and it would make a tinny sound that would come through it. So if you couldn't play the piano, at least you could pump your feet and you would hear something come out of it. And, they, and he had a big business in that as well. But Rossi's is a landmark. I mean, most of you probably remember, some of you anyway, remember Rossi when he crossed the street when he was in Novellas. That was, they were there for years also, but their first store was next door to us. And now, of course, they're between Novella and Ferrara on Grand Street. And they don't, they don't sell sheet music anymore because nobody buys it. Uh, not from them anyway, they go to, they go to Sam Ash for that. Um, but they sell all the little trinkets and things that you can't can't get anywhere else. I mean, I remember coming down here as a kid, um, and you know, buying my mother's pizzel maker. Anybody know pizzelza? Mm -hmm. Pizzel maker with the you know, like little like um, like waffles, only very thin. Buying pizzel maker from Rossi because you could only get certain things down here in this section. Unfortunately. Um, more and more of those stores. There were, and there were several of those stores in those days. They were all gone. Except what that Calendari, what's that? Yes. Okay, and now another staple of the community, and it has its pluses and minuses, um, were the organ grinders. Can you see this picture? Uh -huh. now, we actually have an organ grind, organ in the back too, um, which dates back to 1889. And you would have, and people would be entertained with the organ grinders as well. We're talking about the life of Little Italy, all right? So the, they would be, what they would do is they would have a, a, an organ that they would put on a stick, because it didn't come that way. They would put it mounted on a stick. And then they would have a little monkey that would dance around with a little cup, and they would ask for something that get some donations. It was another way of getting a little entertainment. Also up and down Mulberry Street, there were a lot of bars, in the same area of Little Italy, there were a lot of bars and cafes, and that was a part of the, part of the social, life, social life as well. 
I mean, you have to re you realize with the dingy, dark apartments that they had, you know, getting out into the streets was an important part of, you know, just uh, getting some air and then going into these public places. And the public places weren't so much your apartment, but with these, with these cafes. So that was another way. Another way that they were entertained, I don't think I have a picture of this on here. I don't know if I do or not. Well, that's, that's the, Garibaldi, uh, the Garibaldi Bakery, um, Cafe Garibaldi. Another, another way they were entertained, but you'll see that in here is the puppets. There were, there were three puppet theaters here on Mulberry in this area, in Little Italy. The biggest one was the Matteo Puppet Family. And they had a puppet, 106 Mulberry Street, right next to the Church of Most Precious Blood, which is down here near Canal Street, where Cha Cha's is, by the way, right? where, where their Cha Cha's restaurant is. That's where the Mulberry, where, where the, uh, they had their puppet theater. And it was just, it was a small, it was a store, storefront. And they had a basement, and they had put this, Beautiful. They had put. They made their own stage, and they made the puppets. The two of them that you see up there in the front are the large ones. I have 32 of those in our collection. How'd you get them? The Matteo family gave them to me. I made. I, I became very close friends with Pino Matteo when I was dean of the Calandra Institute, and Pino said, "I want those puppets to come back to Mulberry Street." So when I was able to get this property and purchase it in 2008, Pino, who unfortunately has now got. Alzheimer's is in Florida, told his son Michael, you have to give those puppets to Dr. Shelson. So he gave me all 32 of them. And I have them in our collection, they're in storage right now. As soon as we open up the next section, we hope to have all 32 on display. So you'll be able to see them. It's very, they're very impressive. The question usually comes up, can anybody do a puppet show? The answer is no. And first of all, they're delicate. Uh, although they're very sturdy, if they get damaged, I don't know how to fix them. I don't think there's anybody that's how to fix them. The Jim Henson Society has told me they're the holy grail of puppetry in America. Because they are the first real puppet companies in America. They were, and the puppet shows, with, I have, the, I have the, the, this I hope to get a, a grant from either the Smithsonian or, or from the National Endowment for the Arts. I have the original librettos that Agrippino Matteo wrote back in the 1920s in Italian in composition books. Yeah, in composition books, and I have some original footage, which hopefully isn't too destroyed. We can get it. We can get it restored. Um, of the, that, that was taken of the of them in the in the early in the early days. So you know, there's a lot of work to be done, um, and it just takes it takes an awful lot of time to do it. But if we're going to remember this experience, and it's not just nostalgia. I mean, it, to me, it's nostalgic, but it's not just nostalgia. It really is an important part of the American story. And it's an important part of the Lower East Side. It's an important part of what happened here, because before the Italians, the Irish were here in this area. Before the Irish, the Germans were here in this area. You have the Ben Rensselaer House, which is 149, 149 Mulberry Street, which is right next door, right next door to where the Palazzo is. All right? You know, that, that, was the Van Rensselaer, that was the Van Rensselaer House. So, you know, this, this is wave after wave after wave. As people became more successful, they moved away. You know, of course, now the young people moving back in here are paying ridiculous rents for what their grandparents, you know, were cutting away from. You know, but it's, that's, that's the way it is. The Garibaldi Bakery was 185 Grand Street, which is the store where, with the back of the other side of Il Palazzo. And that was here. And the Cantanelli family had that, had that, um, had that had establishment. And uh, they, were there, they were there for years and years and years as well. Of course, a staple, and people don't think of it, but a way into the civil service was the street, street, street cleaning. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the most famous street cleaners that we have in our community was, was originally Giuseppe Petrosino. Now some of you know him as the, the lieutenant detective that was killed in the line of duty in Palermo when he was investigating the relationship between the black hand and the mafia. And if there was, they were able to deport the criminals. He was killed in Palermo. What you may not know is he was first appointed to the police department but by, by Theodore Roosevelt when he was police commissioner of New York. And he didn't appoint him first as a policeman. He even appointed him first as a sanitation man. <laughs> so these were the, these were, this was the stepping stone. I mean, this was the more menial job that the Italians could get. They couldn't get the job as the police officer yet. So there was a stepping, and that was, that was and, and there was tremendous amount of discrimination. Tremendous. I had the good fortune, and I have the tape of it also, of the, the 
Columbia, the first Columbia Association of New York, Italian American Columbian Associations of New York was the NYPD. <coughs> and I interviewed three of the founders of that organization, they're all dead now. I interviewed them, I have them on video, I have them on videotape, unfortunately. I need to get them transferred into the transfer. And I've got, hopefully they're, they're still, they're still, they're still right. That was 25 years ago I did this, 25 years ago. So I have the, I have the tapes. Of, and when, they, when, I, when I was interviewing them, at that time, as I told you, I was dean of the Calandra Institute at City University. I was at the City University studios. And they're talking up a storm, and they're, you know, they're, they're happy to be there. And these are all guys, and they were in their 80s then. All right? And they tell me about what the discrimination that they got from the Irish cops and how they were how they were how they were given the worst assignments and you know how they had their lockers were turned upside down and all kinds of all kinds of things that they did did to them did to them. As soon as I got them on the air, <laughs> I said, Sal, what are you doing? I said, you just said, I can't talk about that on the air. <laughs> But I got them to say a few things about the founding a little bit, but not 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 the real stuff because it was really it was really it was really rough for them. But yeah, but yeah. So, and today I don't know if people realize it or not, but the largest ethnic group on the NYPD is not Irish; it's Italian. The largest ethnic group in the NYPD today. Um, now you know Saint, the feast of Saint Gennaro is the oldest running feast in New York, all right? Um, street festival feast in New York. It's 86 years old this year. It was 86 years old this year. Um, it was started by the Neapolitans living on Mulberry Street. It made sense because this was the Neapolitan Street. Um, they wanted their patron saint, which is the patron saint, is Gennaro. Um, saint Gennaro is the patron saint of Naples. He was killed by Diocletius, the emperor of Rome, Rome in 305 AD. Now, you know the Romans didn't like the Catholics too much. I mean, they drove into the lions, right? Well, in this case, instead of throwing him to the lions, they cut off his head. Gennaro was the bishop of Naples. They cut off his head, and they saved his blood in two cruets, two vessels. Those two, cruet, those two vessels with his blood reside in the church of most precious blood in Naples. Okay? And every year on September 19th, they process, they have a procession with the blood in the streets of Naples, and the blood turns from solid to liquid. If it doesn't serve to liquid, Bad year, could be a lot of trouble. Um, it's been said that their Vesuvius will erupt, and, you know, and all kind of terrible things will happen. But that's why that's why we have the Feast of Saint Gennaro here on Mulberry Street because this was the Neapolitan Street, and this is why you have the Church of Most Precious Blood, not the Most Precious Blood of Jesus Christ, the Most Precious Blood of Saint Gennaro. This is not Saint Gennaro, but this is typical of what the what the feasts were like in the 1950s. This is from the 1950s, um, which this is the feast of Saint Chero. Saint Chero. There were a lot of different feast days around there. I mean, this the feast of Saint Chero was on Elizabeth Street because this is a Sicilian feast, right? And here they are putting the dollar bills, or in those days they're probably just dollar bills, on on the on the feast. And look at the crowds of people, huge crowds of people. Gather, gathering around, and that's what it was like. But it wasn't the type of thing that you have today. Today, especially thanks to Bloomberg, and I, I know mean, I mean that with tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, the, it's not, it's no longer an Italian feast. I mean, you've got everything from eyeglass vendors to yeah, pina colada sales, yeah, yeah. you know, and I don't particularly like that. You know, so it's that's that's not that's not traditional to me. I mean, it's nice to have everybody have a party, but this is supposed to be a, this is supposed to be an Italian feast. So in any case, they would they would make their own games. And they would have games like uh, throwing uh, throwing a bean bag into uh, slots, or or and they would make their own. And in those days, they made their own sausage, not like what you get today. Mm -hmm. The sausage that you get is not made by them; it's brought from someplace else and brought in here. But you don't you don't have any of those stores anymore. If you want to find those types of places now, unfortunately, you're not going to find them here. The only place I can send you to is Arthur Avenue up in the Bronx, where you'll get a feeling for what the Italian stores were like. You have the Calandra cheese store, you have Rendazzo's, the, the fish store, you have Biancardi's, the meat store, you have Adio Brothers and Madonna Brothers up there, the bread stores. You have none of those down here anymore. They're all gone. They're all gone. The other one, you have Parisi, which is an outlet for Parisi on Mott Street. It's not actually where they make the bread, but they sell, sell some of the bread there. 
they're the last ones, I believe, the last bread store down here. And you know, you don't have any fish stores or any meat meat stores. You have you have um, the Palos across the street in Sala Maria, which is excellent. But um, you don't have the, a lot of those other, other stores that used to exist. They're all gone. All gone. And I venture to say that there are probably more of them gone as as the years go by. I appreciate your your efforts with preservation, but I don't think you're going to bring those those stores back. I think you know maybe the buildings, but not the stores. Um, those people are gone. And the children don't mostly want to do that type of work anymore. The interesting part, though, is that there was something in being in a family business like that that was very, very close. Madonia, for example, um, he's got a ba bachelor's in, in business administration in Madonia Brothers Bakery up in the Bronx. And he had gone off to do um, work, work as a, an accountant or something and, and went back to the store. And Mendoza did the same thing also. So they're very, they're educated. They're men with master's degrees that, that have gone back, that have gone back to that because there's something about working with your family and working in a community that just feeds you in a different way besides, besides money. And it, it's a beautiful thing. My family, I'm one of my family members has a restaurant, six generations on Arthur Avenue, um, um, the, the um, Mario's restaurant, Vero Mario's, mm -hmm. six generations on Arthur Avenue, and still completely family run, still completely family run. There's something that that's really feels good about just being being that type of a situation. Of course, we get we get this is a little bit of my um, proselytizing, I guess, but you know the, the, we get we get hung up in the idea of upward mobility, but we lose sometimes we lose track of what's really or what can be really important. It's nice to have nice things, nice to make a lot of money, but when you when you lose that closeness, you've lost more than more more than you can ever regain. Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> but you had that here. Here's some more of the street cleaners. Ah, this was during the San Gennaro Festival too. You would come and you would see this too. They invented this here. This doesn't happen in Italy. You know, you would see a Giulio in not here on Mulberry Street in Brooklyn, but a Giulio is the high that they would create. But this is the grease pole, and they would, they, you had to climb to the top of the pole to get the prize, and they had to hold it in grease. This was in the 1970s, though. This was the early 1970s. And there's that, that's the original one. Of course, this is what Banca Stabile looked like when it was built in 1885. Um, that's, a, that's a historic photograph. Um, and you had a store selling safes over here next to it. You know, and it's that's what it, that's what it looked like back in the day. You can still see the gas lamps, and that's what it looks like today. Uh, not quite the same. Yeah, Reading. Here we go. Okay. This is the inside of the bank, of course. You can't see all of this as you're walking. Sometimes it's Swiss small, so you don't see. Really can't get a real grasp of it sometimes, but that's the original marble, original trazer floors, the original uh, cages, the bank cages here. Each one had a different service. The one all the way down at the end, the one closest to me, it was for selling steamship tickets. There was a large business in that. This one is paying and receiving. Here it is. Here's another one of the cages. And then, well, like I said, this was a, this was considered the Wall Street of Ledley, Mulberry Street. There were so many banks. They would like one on each block. This is some interesting Italian money that, they, of course, they would change the dollars to lira, liras to dollar. Um, but this one is from, these are from 1943. As you can see, it says, issued in Italy, in English. Because this is occupied money. When we occupied Italy in 1943. Um, I get a kick out of that, because they call this American Italian money. It's like Italian American money. No. <laughs> and here's the steamship ticket sign. The luggage tags. And I have a, one or two of the valises and, and steamship trunks. And in the third showcase, you'll also see a copy of the tickets. $30 across the Atlantic Ocean. Carolina Colville, Francis. And of course, all up and down Mulberry Street, this you would see in, the, in push cars. Uh, some of them went on to become very, very successful entrepreneurs, but this is what you, this is where you would get your, your, your produce, 
um, and not only your produce, whether it was chestnuts, or it was, it was fish, or it was dry goods. And this was the actual size of the cart. The one I have, the one I have up here, where I have the uh, little gifts in the front, that is an actual push cart. It was falling apart. I got it in Brooklyn, but we had it restored to what the original shape and size, and that's exactly what it looked like. They were on a slant, and you'll notice that's on a slant so that people could look into it, and uh, they would be one next to another, next to another, next to another, next to another. And some of the pictures I have outside, too, show some of, those, some of the old carts uh, in the street. And the only one left on Mulberry Street is inside here. You know, there's not one left anymore. This is the only one. Did they rent the spots? How did they know their spot was secure? I wouldn't exactly you call it rent. You better not come to this. <laughs> but I mean, uh, but, but, they, but they secured their spot. They secured it. They secured it, but it wasn't by the city that they secured it from. No, it wasn't by the city. So you better not take my spot. <laughs> no, it was, done, it, was, it, was, it was, they had their own system of you know, doing that spot. They did. At the end of the day, did they move the carts away? Or they yeah, just at the end of, no, at the end of the day, they left, no, the carts were left there without the produce on it. Without, without the produce on it. Yeah, they would leave them, they would leave them there at night. But uh, you know, there was, there, this was this was considered, in some ways, the safest and also s the neighborhood in New York, because uh, you know, nobody touched anything. If you did, uh oh, no hands. Exactly, <laughs> something would happen. Yeah. <laughs> this, is the, this is the inside. Um, this of uh, the bank, okay. and this is the bank vault in the back. Um, where Stabile kept the, kept his money, and the front cages, one another one of the puppets, the puppetino that's on the side over here, the organ grinder that you can look at in the back afterwards with the monkey on top, organ, there he is with the monkey again. Oh yes, Anna Pakora's wedding gown. Um, there, are, you know, weddings of course have always been important celebrations and you know this was probably the you know the best dress you're ever going to buy in your life this one happens to be a white dress that we have on but the one in the window also is a wedding gown too we have several wedding gowns wedding dresses that are in colors because you would buy something that was you know just you would be able to use again there was you know just something you just wouldn't buy it for one day that was unusual to have a white wedding gown you had a little, you were a little more affluent if you could do, if you could do this and this is a shirt waist. And some of you know, you've heard of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. We have the dedication to it in that window. This is what a shirt waist looked like. Um, the women wore a skirt underneath, and you, this is the way they would dress. And they would have the shirt waist on top. This is called a shirt waist. And this is what they were making when, when they, when unfortunately those poor women were killed. And that's the machine that they kind of, the singer sewing machine that they would be working on. And this is the iron coal iron that you put the coal inside. Um, it was a harsh life, but it was a wonderful life. You know, and, and as time progressed, it faded. And now we have uh, the museum to keep it alive. Um, that's really basically the story of the, of the immigrants and, and what, they, what they've accomplished and what they struggled with. Um, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try. with um, so if you have any